Back-to-back nights for the Toronto Maple Leafs on the Real Kipper and Bourne Show, the Leaf edition. Nick Kiprios, Justin Bourne, Sammy McKee, Derek Brandeo, Jen Rolnick for the next two hours. We are live on Sportsnet 590, Sportsnet 360, Sportsnet Plus from 4 to 6. Download us when you can't catch us live on your favorite pod. And remember to text us at 590-590. You got something really interesting to tell Sammy who can tell us. And then we'll tell you where to go. Yes. Yeah. We will. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Halfway there on the uh, back-to-back, as I just mentioned, the Leafs drop a 4-3 decision to the Philadelphia Flyers. It was so good for so long against those Flyers. Mm -hmm. All good things must come to an end, JB. And uh, it looked like the Leafs may have had, if they may have had another two or three minutes, they were tying this game up. But that doesn't take away the fact that uh, it's pretty ugly for those first 40 minutes. Yeah, it was. You know, it was a really weird game for me. And I don't know how you felt about it, but I, you know, I have a tough time analyzing that game last night because statistically they were good. They, you know, high danger chances, 14 to five for the Leafs. They hit six posts, you know, all these things you think were good, but you couldn't help but watch that game and go, ah, pretty ugly. I don't know. What was your overall takeaway? Yeah, I did not like it at all. You didn't? No. And I I don't care what the stats. I got to tell you, I am downright stunned by that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. you're gonna love that one <laughs> i i don't care what the stats said i don't yeah. care what the analytics said uh that's not a team that uh looks like they're getting moving forward no. to to getting ready for a, a first round match yeah and i don't know if if they just think that they're gonna snap their fingers and get it all going by mid-april but i i'd, I'd, I'd have some concerns and the one thing that I liked the most, and we'll get into it uh, with Sheldon Keefe momentarily, is that he didn't brush it off as just uh, a game where he could find some positives. He found no positives, and I'm glad he didn't because neither did I. Yeah, and we are all dumber for having watched that. No, honestly, <laughs> like I'd say it was like one of those things, like that game from start to finish really provided no answers. And when you're moving towards the playoffs – what you're looking for is, is it coming together? You know, like, do you, you know, what about this is going to translate to playoffs? You know, now they're on their one month sort of ascension towards game one. And I wrote an article today and we'll get more into it on the show. But my article is just about who, what are the lines? Like going into game one, is there any one line that you like or D pair that you like? Have they established anything? For this team in playoffs? Outside, uh, to answer your question, over the course of Sheldon's coaching tenure with with the Leafs, all all I can remember is Mitch and Austin. Mitch and Austin. That's exactly, you know, what's in my article is that there's one forward pair that is going to be together game one, assuming Mitch is healthy. And then after that, I literally cannot give you a second pair of forwards who are likely to play together. And so I won't do my article in oral form here, but the idea was... Let's do a reading. (laughs) Just read the article. The idea was if you go back and look at this Leafs team in the postseason over the past few years, against the Florida Panthers last year, the Florida Panthers used four forward lines total. In five games. In five games. They didn't Come have, on. they never changed it up. Not a, not a fifth line. What? They had two shifts together. Four total. The, total. The Toronto Maple Leafs used 22. 22 versions of a line. So this is not a one-off in that series. When they lost to Tampa prior to that, they used 24 lines. When they beat Tampa, I think it was like 19 or something like that. Okay, not to derail nope, your, nope, your nope. thoughts. Um, my, we have Paul Maurice coming up yes. at the top of the hour remind me to talk about your article yes. today in sportsnet.ca about just running four lines in five games. I, I think it's I, like, I'm shocked to hear it. When the Vegas Golden Knights beat Florida in the cup final, Vegas used seven lines, but four of them played entirely. Wow. And the other three lines all played one minute together. Okay. So they used four lines. And the Leafs? Well, the Leafs did not make it that far, but in their other series, they were all around 20. 20 20 to 25 all around average 20 last few years yeah 
20. So, you know, it's... That is... That's the bingo bango balls. And so, you know, I, I'm sitting here watching that game last night. I'm like, what line? I know Reeves is out and Marner's not there and Yarncroft's not there, but there was no moment when I knew who was on whose line. Yeah. <laughs> okay. you, know, you usually can know who to, like... You know, when somebody comes out, you look for who's coming next with them. And it's like, it oh, it's like me. That means here comes, could have been any. I don't know. I don't know. And we, if we were to put a, a finger on this, mm-hmm. and this runs to kind of the consistency that you've talked about, Sheldon, over, over the years on our show anyways, yep. that if he's chasing the score, he'll make different decisions. He'll, he just, the, he, being down a couple of goals will not lean towards him just sticking with whatever he's got going. It's like I'm changing it up or I'm going yeah. back to what I thought worked yeah. in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and so that game last night, you know, there was, like, I think the D pairs stayed together, which I don't know if that was a great thing because Riley and Brody were struggle fest 98. It was, uh, it was not pretty back there either. Can, so. can we do a, a GoFundMe? And so they'll never play them together. Play them together. <laughs> what do we have? What's to a GoFundMe have to do with that? Well, yeah, we're we're, gonna we're just gonna we're gonna have so much money <laughs> that we're gonna just either give it to Sheldon or the players themselves. The players themselves. We we gotta buy them apart. <laughs> That's my point. Yeah, find I, a way. I guess it's that they were really good for a really long time, and over. Keith is just searching for something with a decor that. We've all had conversations about that may not be the best one in the league. I think it's a fair to say. Yeah. And he's going back to something that he thinks should work. And boy, okay. it just doesn't. Just give me something right now in pairs going into Washington tonight. And by the way, in about uh, what, uh, 15 minutes or so, we're going to have Alan May join us who covers the Washington Capitals for NBC Washington. He'll help us tee up tonight. Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, JB, give me pairs tonight okay. that don't include Riley and Brody together. Okay. Uh, so give give me uh, Riley and Labushkin. Give me uh, Benoit and McCabe on his offside, Edmondson and Lilligren. I, I think Benoit is... Was really good, you know, not really good, but he was one of the guys last night that I thought skated and looked pretty decent. It, it to me that Benoit McCabe pairing hasn't been what they wanted it to be necessarily, but I okay, hold on for a second. You you're taking Brody out, yeah. Oh, okay, which I suggested a while ago, but um, I got him right out of the lineup tonight. I know, but he he's not coming out. I don't. I cannot see Sheldon now bailing on Brody if he has not bailed on him already. When's it too? Is it too late? Is it too close to playoffs to start messing it, with it, his confidence? Yes. Could he is. play worse? Um, I don't know, but he cannot. He, he cannot play the right side. You can't tell me that Benoit is not more effective as a defender for the Leafs right now. Am I? Am I out on no. over my skis here? And I thought Benoit was a, you know, and we get to listen to Keith talk about how he hated everyone last night, but I thought Benoit was a lone or one of the only bright spots for me where it's like oh yeah like missed having that guy in the lineup so he did a puck up the ice a couple yeah. times yeah, that one, shot there was yeah. one where I was like, eh, a little a little too aggressive but the i think it, i think he was too excited it, just getting back in it's not like he, brody's in his late 30s here is it just lack of confidence is it focus with him it's speed to me and when your speed goes and you're someone who plays tactically and defends the blue line whatever what is he? He's not physical. He's not offensive. It's, you know, I, yeah. I want to be wrong here. The Leafs need a good Brody for their PK oh, to yeah. stabilize a pair. He makes five mil. Like, they need him to be good. But when he's not, I can't pretend he has been. And if I guess if, to your point, if there was ever a night they were going to do it, second half of back-to-back where he comes off struggling, you can be like, oh, he's a little bit banged up. You don't have to show mm-hmm. him up and, you know, say that he's a healthy, say he's a bit banged up, bring him into the lineup give them a rest until they play Saturday night, another back-to-back. I don't know. I could see it happening, I guess, but probably not. Yeah, it is unlikely, I admit that. I'm okay with even Edmondson and Brody. It's just something different. Edmondson and Brody together. Yeah. Yeah, okay. 
I can, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll, let, let's have a look at that. Edmondson's fine on the on his off wing. You'd play Edmondson on the right side. Yes, and I put Brody on the left side. Would you really? This is the full shelter treatment. Here's a yes. big defensive D-man for you yes. for once, instead of you being that for someone else. Yes. Okay. And the, then there's this saying as about shuffling some sort of chairs on a sinking <laughs> ship. But I don't know exactly how the saying goes. That would be the Titanic. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But that we're sink? looking for something. <laughs> I just want something where you go. They had a good night. Let's see if we got something here. Yeah. All right, let's go to Sheldon <laughs> Keefe for our first Kippers Clipper on the overview of the game last night. Just weren't sharp. We weren't sharp mentally. Couldn't pass the puck, couldn't handle the puck, didn't defend, didn't compete. So not a lot to like. <laughs> oh, <boy>. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for not finding one positive. And I mean that. Yeah. I'm usually the guy who looks for them. And other than maybe Benoit, I am struggling yeah. to give you one. So if they Tavares, I like Tavares okay. If they hit, so how many posts they hit last night? Seven, including the one that went in. If three of those go in off the post instead of out, is he singing the same tune? If my aunt had so. <laughs> Sammy, they hit six. I posts, don't care. Kipper. They hit six. I posts. don't care. You don't care at all. Uh, six non shots on goal. <laughs> okay, that's yeah. what you had last night. <laughs> yeah. You didn't even get credited for a shot on goal. I don't care about six posts. You should change that. Do, don't even bring that in the uh, equation. Okay. okay. Stick to Sheldon's comments. Okay. We sucked, and we are less than a month away from the Stanley Cup playoffs. We better get our act together. Fair. Totally let's, fair. Let's hear Sheldon on the post. See if he agrees with uh, Kipper. Clip three, please. <clears throat> Yeah, we had a ton of chances, second period, third period, uh, you know, but it could have been a lot worse in the first period at the same time. So uh, you, you can't you can't play catch up hockey on the road and expect to expect to win. So, you know, we uh, we weren't ready to go. That's on me uh, to start the game in the first period and uh, dig yourselves a hole. It's amazing when you do that, how all of a sudden the luck doesn't go your way. Okay, I'm loving Sheldon this today. Loving him. <laughs> loving him. Yeah, this, real. Shocker. It's, it's real. The time he's the most sour, you love him the most. His comments are real. I know. Yeah. He's right. But I, listen, I'm just playing devil's advocate with the six posts here. But like, yeah, I, I'm glad he's like this because. Even the part where he says it's on me. Thank you. It's your team. It's your head. You're the head coach. It's a horrible start. Horrible. John Tavares, a goal and two assists. I don't care. You were soft as a pillow on the first shift. You brought the yeah. puck into the middle. You lost it. 19 seconds later, it's in the net. Horrible well, start. Well, if you're, you know, he was critical of himself. Keith was. Why are we starting John Tavares on the road with who, who is he with? Robertson, Nyes and Nyes. Robertson and Lilligren on the back. Like, why is that Listen, our first option? I'm, I'm actually okay with that. I'm okay with that because. We got to put these guys in a position where they feel important. Starting a hockey game in the NHL is a big deal. Okay? I've had maybe four my whole career. Oh, come on. No, I'm telling you. You don't start third and fourth line. You start number one line. You, you start Messier's. You start Matthews. Yeah, that makes sense. You start <laughs> yeah, yeah. with David. Yeah. You know why? Because you don't want to get buried the first minute and set a tone that that carries mentally. It's like one bad shift in the second period doesn't have the same mental effect on you as a bad first shift. Because you carry all your prep work. And to, to Sheldon's point, you flush your prep down the toilet with a bad first shift. That's why you always see the stars start. Because the coaches are scared to death and having a bad shift mm -hmm. that can now have a domino effect on you. And I'm okay with Ro Robertson. Put him in there. You got to find out. You got to make him feel important. But it's up to you, Nick, and JT. And I don't know who the left winger was with it. Oh, nice. nice. Come on, guys. Can't get soft here. You're playing a team. Won the draw, too. That, that just... Yeah. Exactly. You win the draw, and you still... The, you're shoveling a puck out of your net 19 seconds later. Yeah, thanks, Ilya, by the way. But that first shift, all the boys should have said is, 
get, get it in deep. Yeah. Get it in deep, boys. Do not mess around here. They've lost, what, eight in a row. Their coach just benched their captain. He's full of piss and vinegar. They're going to come out here. We got to be ready. And they weren't. It was a terrible first shift. Yeah, you know, I I don't know where you stand on this, but, like, I made this joke doing Leafs talk with Sam last night, which was just, like, the one thing I have some issue with is people are like, you can't give up a goal in the first period. You can't, you know, it's crucial. And then you can't give up a goal in the final minute of the first period. You can't give one up in the final minute. Yeah, you can't give up a goal in the first shift after a power play. You just can't do it. You can't, and all of a sudden, you know, there's no game left. It's like you never want to give up. Yeah. You always want to have good shifts. I know, I know. But it's what you carry. It's, it's those last thoughts carrying it into a, a dressing room and it's for sure the final there, there, minute there's ones just are that, that, that momentum yeah that you have to sit and and fester for 15 minutes yeah it's that last shift that you're thinking about yeah you know it's, right? but we, we just talk a lot to me about the Leafs not being prepared for shift, you know the starts of periods and is it worse for the Leafs than other teams I don't know That's, so I Saturday doubt it. night end of periods S- and S- end of S- games feel like have it. to yeah. be worse it has or the to be. beginning. How many times have they given up goals early to start periods? You or, know, or I'm sure there's statistical analysis. Saturday that be done night. On this. Saturday night they had the lead, and within 20 seconds of the third period against Carolina, uh, Connor Dewart's shoveling a puck off the goal line, or else mm. it's three three in in the opening minute. Yeah, you know, it definitely okay. seems like it happens. I don't know if it's true, but you're you're right. You're right that that's... That, what, what are you guys doing? What are you yeah. talking about in between periods? And, like, what what's happening here? Mm-hmm. That you're having these mental lapses to, to start or finish uh, periods or games. Well, we have Keith on not ma- matching the Flyers' intensity uh, clip two. Let's follow up with that. I don't think it has anything to do with urgency necessarily. We just, we clearly weren't sharp, especially on our half of the ice, so... And we weren't willing to do the things uh, necessary tonight uh, from the start of the game. I thought we competed pretty good on the offensive side, but uh, you got to do a better job on, in your own zone uh, with and without the puck, and, and we were very poor in that area tonight. It's actually shocking that Nick Robertson got back on the ice after the first five minutes or whatever where he's the weak side winger and his guy just walks down Main Street behind him. It's like, God, man. You know, you're healthy scratch. All you must be thinking about is defensive coverage. How do you not? It's the one thing you do in the D zone. I, I totally agree, but I'm okay with, with the Leafs where they are, and we'll, I'm sure we will lead to a discussion on the standings. Mm-hmm. But where they are right now, with there's, there's, no, there's no panic in, in losing a playoff spot here. So why not put these guys in a position to be tested now? Because eventually, if you, if you think you're going to win two rounds or three rounds to get to a... Uh, a conference final or a Stanley Cup final, you got to put these guys in tests now. Mm-hmm. And a few of them failed last night. Yeah, no, no doubt. But keep throwing them out there, even if it means that that Austin or or Nylander don't get to pad their stats. I'm okay with that. Learn something about the rest of your lineup, and he learned something last night. Give him another chance. Put them back in the fire again and remind them you failed last night, but you're going to get another chance here and you got to pass. But I do wonder when do we go from this is the educational portion of the season and we're learning what these guys can do in these situations to, okay, you know, that part's over. Now we're playing yeah. the best guys in the best situation. Yeah. We're playoff ready. This is the national hockey. You have no <laughs> choice. You have no choice but to keep throwing them out there because it will not. Your your lineup isn't deep enough. Mm-hmm. Even if if you sit there and go, okay, I got six guys going, and I got six. You can't just go with six guys. You got to keep throwing them out there. the The lessons never stop. Mm-hmm. But you hope that if there's enough repetition in in the in the teaching moments, that they get to relax a little bit more. They get to learn a little bit something about themselves, and that's what I think the next dozen games should be all about. Keep throwing. Holmberg and McMahon and Robertson out there, even if they look bad, you have no choice, man. You got to build these guys up. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta have them feeling somewhat in a in a responsible mode. Yeah, to get ready for game one. Yeah, you know it's funny. I in researching for this article today, I was looking at some of the other of the recent Cup champions and what their lines look like. You know, a little bit farther down the lineup. 
it's not like they're perfect. Like, Matt Amadio is on the third line for Vegas last year who was a waiver release of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Like, you know, if you're with guys that can support you, some of these guys can can play. Like, you can h- cover up, you know, Robertson or Holmberg or whoever if they're on a decently supported line. Yes, you're right. And I think the best example so far who's come a long way is Bobby McMahon. Right. right. He is Abe the perfect Kubel, example. One of Colorado. You, you, yeah, you had him for half a season at 10 minutes and now in the last week and a half we've seen him go from 15 to 17 minutes probably a little under 17 last night for him but he's now become an important guy because he is now being thrown out there more and I think he's a lot calmer he doesn't have to feel like he's got to make a a great play to get his next shift he knows it's coming just need about Two or three more of those guys. Yeah. Holmberg. That was Ben Watson me last night where he doesn't know his next shift's coming, so it just seemed like a little much, a little too aggressive, a little too excitable. Holmberg, Robertson, you know, the, uh, you know, even Matthew Nyes. There's some shifts where he looks pretty darn good, and there's other ones where he's like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. So yeah, get him off the ice. In another dip for but me. Th- they're not going anywhere without those guys. No, they, they going. are going to need him. You know, I thought a good example of that last night is Lilligren, as involved as he was. Goalie pulled. He got a lot of touches in the offensive zone in big situations. Now, I don't love that necessarily, you know, that that he's in those spots, but I appreciate that it should help with his confidence and give him reps he needs. And so they clearly see this as a guy that they want to be involved. And I don't know. This is They're, they're doing what you're talking about, Kip, giving him the opportunity yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned the schedule there, like, and them being locked into a spot. I was listening to Bunkus this morning talking about this, and it was something that I hadn't really thought of, but they've been in this malaise to the end of season for, since 2017, 2018, basically. Where it's just the March malaise? It's just a, you know, death march to playing either the Bruins or the Lightning or the Panthers for the last bit of the season. You can't really move up. You can't really move down. And how much of that has led to what's happened in the playoffs with them not playing any intensity down the stretch? Like, you think about these teams, like, I mean, it's a very easy example to draw, but look at Florida last year, Mm -hmm. where they are playing fighter scrapping, life or death, and they go down 3-1 to to, to Boston, but they've been playing playoff hockey for however many weeks, and they come back, they win, they go all the way to the final or whatever, Mm -hmm. like, these malaise games, it just feels like it's happened to them every single year. And a lot of that's because if they've lost to bad teams. I know all that. But, like, they're never playing intense games down the stretch. They're meaningless. Yeah. Well, listen. Then. Like, that has to have tonight, an effect. Lose to Edmonton, Carolina, New Jersey, Washington, and then start Florida feeling like. But th- yeah, you got to play to <laughs> save your season. Mode. Yeah, they're, they might they're get just, there organic, <laughs> but they're just not. Like, listen, they're not going to do that. They're they have too much skill. They, yeah, they, they're, they're, they're good. Eighty-five points. If they get ten points, they're in playoffs in the next fourteen they've been, games. They've been winning a lot. Like they win five times. But it's this just, is four or five. It's this just, is, that's what's wrong with the listen, almost war. This is friggin' she, standings. This is where Sheldon has to find a way to overcome that, Sammy. That's your head coach who sets the table. Practice games, dinners, meetings, sense of uh, we're go- we're going nowhere, guys. Mm-hmm. You want to play like that? It's over. It is Daryl Sutter. Eight days, yeah, guys. Okay, if you think you're going to come to the rink and just outscore your mistakes in the first two periods and think you still got a chance by playing this river hockey and last one to touch the puck wins. You're done. I get all that. And he is going to be hammering them with that for the next three weeks. Mm-hmm. But it's human nature. I, I, I don't like, I'm I know. I'm not the, sure if he's going to hammer them or not. You know how I'm well, going to no, He's going to be telling them like process, process. He's going to be having all his meetings that he loves to have. They're going to be telling him all the different things. He's but, going to oh, be coaching hey. just as hard. But it's human nature for these but, guys. But, They're like, this doesn't matter. But, but we'll it know. doesn't matter. We'll know by watching. We'll know by watching. If he's tricked them into caring. Yes. But how can you, it's the same guy saying the same things for five straight seasons in the exact same situation you've been in. Mm-hmm. I don't get, I, I know they're professional, they're making so much money. They should be trying their hardest every night, and I believe they do.
But in the back of their mind, it's like, well, another one that doesn't not, matter. Not life or death, yeah. Because we can't move up, we can't move down because of all these great rivals that have been created by Gary's sweet playoff format. Yes. One thing I did want to touch on um, was Joseph Wall not being available. Yeah. Or last night he didn't back up. I talked to, um, you know, I trying to figure out, we were all kind of trying to figure out what happened, where he was. But talking to my buddy uh, Michael Amato, who works here at Sportsnet, and mm -hmm. basically he was just suggesting what is pretty obvious. They have three goaltenders. If you want Wall to start in the second half of the back-to-back, -back, you might as well have Jones on the bench in case you pull the goalie. Wall's still available as your starter for the next night. Carolina does this with three, so yeah. he's going to go tonight. No, I don't think there's any great conspiracy about where Wall's been or no, no and injury. I or... almost have to revert to our conversation a couple of days ago where they're going to they're going to give Wall plenty of opportunities here to get his ready uh, game ready by game 1. What's it been four straight for Samson? So, yeah. I think yeah, four straight, but I think that they wanted to use that window too to to listen, Joseph Wall was off two plus months. Yeah. So this is like a get back in a couple games. Let's like slow and, her down. And put practice. the work in yeah. and then put the work in. So we assume he's playing tonight. Yeah. And if he has a good outing, I could see him getting Saturday as well. Really? So but was that based off Samson off last night? Did you like Samson off? Not really, but he's the least of my worries right now for the Leafs. The goaltending, we're going to question right to the very end. Yeah. But as of now, I think there's a lot of focus that needs to go uh, to certain individuals or lines or mm -hmm. D, D combos. Right now, I think they're going to give Samsonov and Wall ample opportunities the last, what, 15 games. Yeah. Let's uh, listen to the coach on Samsonov and we'll jump back in. I think he was like the group that I, I didn't like anybody tonight. For defense <laughs> goaltending, didn't like anybody. Okay, <laughs> got it. No one, no one good. I thought he like so mad. He talked for a minute forty, a minute forty total. That's uh, they weren't very good. He was I, swimming a little bit. Well, I thought that like an open door or a closed door that he like m made himself an open door. He got narrow at times and and almost got out of the way of pucks. Lines goal. Was no good. No. I thought maybe was that the one where he, there was some contact it looked like, but he kind of yeah. played it up and twisted yeah, but it a bit. Even like Benoit giving up the middle on the three sixty move. And wow. then and then uh McCabe like over back checks. Same with Robertson. Right. Well yeah. it was a it was a complete gong Buster. show. I, I actually Buster. put that whole thing on Max, who fires a absolute laser saucer straight towards the bat the blue line behind the net with yeah. no support and it's like how it wasn't even didn't even need to saucer it yeah he had He's no chance risk with his pass he had no chance to make a play on that it goes down the other way benoit's out of position then it's a you know soup sandwich like you like it to say was it just wasn't sandwich. pretty that's a great use of soup Thank sandwich you. yeah shout out to darren underwood for that willie nylander has 27 points in the last 20 games there's a few people and let me tell you he's minus three over that time texting people are texting the monster season continues and I, like I don't know, am I watching the same thing here? Because we know how skilled he is. We know that. He's yeah. so good. He's actually the human embodiment of the Leafs, isn't he? Yes. Like, he can do it. Almost better than anyone in the league. But I think but his boy, games risky. regressed since the first 40, 50 games. Yep, I think he has three or four blue line turnovers for breakaways in the last three or four games. He... He, uh, no person makes more plays and hands over more pucks in the same game, this guy. High event both ways, electric to watch. And it's not, doesn't look like it's changing anytime soon. I <laughs> didn't, no. he, was, he did limit this stuff. He can do it. Right? He can do it. The first 40 games. He did he can not? do it. I think so, Is yeah. It, after the All-Star break, it kind of, like. It's almost like there was this one moment in the, throughout the season where it all sort of <laughs> changed. Let me think about this it. A contract. Oh, when he got 92 schmillion? <laughs> Maybe that was the moment it all changed. There was more intense. Not saying, just saying. <laughs> he played a heavier game in the first half. He did. Yeah. Hey, I, no argument. I, I think this guy, I have no worries. You talk about guys you're not worried about, that the moment doesn't get too big for him. He's able to show up and be there and be the same guy. The problem is the same guy 
takes a lot of chances and doesn't always think defensively responsible. And he is unbelievably dynamic. Last year, Kipper, we had the conversations, one of our big conversations all year was how much more consistent Willie had been. That had been the biggest jump for him where he cut out those weak stretches where he didn't notice them. And we talked about that all. And then right around this time last year, in the standings malaise that they were in again last year, this happened and without the production. Like, you have the production now that's there, but the defensive side of the puck, like even Mike Johnson last night on the broadcast did a great job bringing it up. He's above the puck, like, on multiple different occasions. On the, yeah, offensively, he's yeah. above it. Like, yeah. instead he, of, like... He's just not... Where he shouldn't be. He's just not locked in. Mm -hmm. And I think I have belief that he will be once it starts. It's just this whole team... Has uh, nothing to play I for. Worry more about There's Austin nothing and Mitch to play than for. I do Willie and playoffs. Agree. Couldn't agree more. But he, Couldn't agree do you more. Remember, like against Florida, game two, the Leafs were up two one to start the second period, and he has a moment where he just starts dangling in the neutral zone. He falls, and Barkov goes in there and buries it. That's just Willie. He does it in the playoffs too. Yeah, I vaguely. He does. Remember. Yeah, I'm just saying though. Yeah. It's like. It's, it's crept in in the playoffs on occasion too. I know he's got yeah. this th this feeling like he steps up and he's way better than Matthews and Marner in the playoffs, which I'm not really buying all that much. I just think he's the same much. player he is. He doesn't change. But if if he if he gives up as many as he gets, what are we doing? Agreed. It's a huge. This is the same. My feeling with Robertson. I got you know my my buddies texted me like pitchers last night. They shared the points per sixty or whatever. Oh, yeah, you know yeah, Robertson's yeah. fourth on the team and whatever. It's like he gives up as many that way, unfortunately. You know, and and Willie does not give up as many that way as he does offensively, but he can on certain nights. And last night, I think he did. All right, we've solved nothing. Nope, and we're just getting started. <laughs> uh, when we return, we got Alan May helping us tee up the Washington Capitals. Are they back in it or what? That power play of theirs is humming. Here comes Ovi. Here comes Ovi. Sammy. He's he's hot. <laughs> Let's go to break. All right, <laughs> Ovi. Alan May, when we return on the Real Kipper and Bourne Show. The Toronto Maple Leafs set to play their second game in as many nights. They battle the Washington Capitals. Let's bring in Alan May, former National Hockey League player. More importantly, my right winger when I broke into the league. Yes. Now doing a terrific job covering the Washington Capitals for NBC Washington. <clears throat> Maisie, what's going on? Nothing. You forgot to say that I think I assisted on your first goal as well, but we won't bring that up. Wow. You did, and the late Doug Wickenheiser. There's my first goal. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, wasn't it a good one, too? Oh, it was fantastic. Uh, Joe Louie. Sammy St. Laurent didn't stand a chance. <laughs> Poor guy. I think I ended his career that night. First overall, and uh, did you get drafted? <laughs> undrafted. Got two undrafted wingers that did pretty good for themselves. There you so. go. All right, listen. Um, uh, uh, Capitals need wins. They got to climb in there, but uh, it's a race I didn't necessarily see maybe a month ago, but... Uh, how has this been done in terms of uh, the Washington Capitals now having a legitimate shot at making the playoffs? Well, if you just look at the goal differential, when I say it's been pure defense, you'd laugh me out of the room, but it's been pure defense in the last 15 games. It's been 10-4-1 and one in that time. And you look at the goals for, 54 goals for, 44 goals against. But of those goals against, 23 have come in the four losses and only seven goals for in those four losses. Uh, the power play is finally clicking. I think it's 16 power play goals for seven power play goals against in that time, but it's been swarming defense. They've been playing better without the puck. I think they realize they're not the fastest team. Uh, they're certainly not the slowest team, but they're not the fastest. And they're realizing they're not the offensive juggernaut. They used to be, they need a five man swarm. They got to stay above the puck. Uh, and it's a very similar to what you saw out of the Philadelphia Flyers last night against the Leafs. They block out the middle of the ice, and Charlie Lindgren's job has been a lot easier. He only has to worry about the half of the net where the puck is on, and he just gets that glove out there. They're keeping shots to the perimeter. The high dangers are going down. In most of their wins, they're suffocating teams. Uh, the penalty kill has been really big for them. Most of the season has been pretty good. Uh, the power play was awful at the start of the year. It was either in 32nd, 31st, or 30th place, and I think that everyone finally got the 
the attention of the coaching staff after a game at Edmonton just over a week ago where they just got the doors blown off them trying to trade goals at the Oilers. And after that, they settled down. Three really good games of excellent defense uh, against Seattle, Vancouver, and against the Calgary Flames just the other night. But uh, it's been team defense all the way. Team defense has led to, um, you know, some really good goaltending, too, from Charlie Lindgren. Over the month of March, uh, he's got the best save percentage of 940. Um, is this a surprise, a revelation? You know, this guy, I think he's almost 30 years old. Where where did this guy come from? Well, unfortunately, he came from be, being behind excellent goaltending. When yeah. he was in St. Louis, they had Husso and Bennington and Montreal, Carey Price and Jake Allen. So when you look at that, it, the opportunities aren't there. Like you, you have to go to the right place at the right time to get your opportunity. No pressure last year being a backup. Every time he went in, he was spectacular. The entire team fell apart down down the stretch last year, and, and you know everything about Laviolette's system caught up to the team. This year, right from the get go, he's been battling hard. The glove hand, uh, playing with a ton of confidence, and I think that's bred confidence from his teammates. But He's been there. He was just always in the wrong place at the right time. And now he's in the right place. And it certainly looks like the right time. Alan, uh, in 2018, when the Washington Capitals won the Stanley Cup, Kuznetsov could have easily uh, won a Conn Smythe uh, and looked like a guy that was just going to be a Washington Capital for a very long time. He ends out up uh, out the door at the trade deadline. Who, who has benefited on, on this roster because of that? Who can we watch tonight that uh, um, is now eating up some of those minutes? Well, I think the biggest thing with, with getting Evgeny out of town, you know, we, unfortunately he had to go to rehab. He was gone for a while. Uh, he was away from the team for about six weeks. And then when he got back, they didn't let him back in, basically. They knew they had something worked out with Carolina. But it's benefited Connor McMichael uh, has been given a more important role every single game. And he, he deserves the role. It wasn't just handed to him. He had to really work hard the last couple of years. Uh, he's developed an all-round game. His two-way play is way better. It used to be about, you know, those guys that score 50 and 60 in junior like yourself. you got to figure out what your role is. And he has figured out that his role needs to be a competent all-round center that stops on pucks, battles for pucks. And then they called up Hendricks LaPierre a while back, and he had a hat-trick his last game in the American League against the Belleville Senators. And he came into the caps, and he was flying. He was on a confidence high, and he was skating not just fast on offense, the back checking, the tenacity that he skated with. He doesn't have to worry about getting a jersey every game. And he's really stepped up and he's really hidden some of the slower wingers or the wingers that aren't get, getting there as fast as they used to be. His two way game is really developed. His puck protection, his puck management, way better. And I think you and I have talked about it before how important it is to play in the American Hockey League. And if you could be on a good team and go to the finals, what that does for you learning about defensive play, the sacrifice, the block shots, take hits, make plays, everything that goes involved with winning. All these Capitals players that were on that roster to finish last year win the Calder Cup with a team that really shouldn't have won the Calder Cup, they've all benefited and they've all came here ready to play. Beck Malenstein, Alexi Protus, uh, they, they played very, very well. And because of that growth and getting that two extra months of hockey, those guys had a little bit of cheat code on everyone else. So they, they developed confidence in themselves and the organization – knew that it was time to let these guys start getting in the lineup, and they haven't let management down. They haven't let the coaching staff and certainly not their teammates down with their evolved play, and the all-round play has been a lot better. It's been a lot better to watch because we all know when you first come out of junior, especially the high picks, they think they're still going to be that guy, the guy, and it takes a while. If you're not ready for NHL day one, it, it takes some hard work, usually about three years in the minors, in my opinion, to get yourself ready. And when you're here in the States, it's you're not under the gun, under the microscope so much to develop and have to produce in the American League. And what's wrong with this guy? You just kind of put them there. You kind of boil them, get them ready, and then you bring them up when they're uh, perfectly baked. So there, there's so many, good, so many good things about what these young players are doing right now. So the young guys are making a big difference for them, but I got to believe if you look at, uh, so the Leafs, or sorry, the Caps power play percentage in the first half of the year up until December was 30th in the league. And since then they've been at 28%, fourth best in the league since. Got to believe that's on the back of the Vets. That's on the back of Ovi, who now has 20 goals in 19 straight NHL seasons. What has changed for Ovechkin that he seems back? He's alive! He's back! Well, I think the big thing is at the start of the year, 
their five guys that were on the power play were melting the ice because they weren't moving around. They were just standing in that one, three, one. And I don't know what happened, who said what, if it was coaching staff or was players finally having a blowout with each other or maybe getting, getting ready in a, like a cocktail napkins and figuring out what they could do. But they all started moving around. And most importantly, Ovi got out of the old office and he started to go on the right side of the point where John Carlson was. John Carlson was kind of staying up on the left D and teams didn't know what to do. And all of a sudden the players started to realize there were more openings when Ovi moved up there. And Ovi is an incredible passer. We know he's got a wicked shot, but he was doing the same thing for so long. It was basically 15 years of that setup. His career has a, has been longer, but it's been 15 years of that setup. And they were standing around looking for perfect passes. They weren't even getting any quality looks. And once he finally started to move around, everyone else started to move around. I don't think it matters which five guys are out there or that four other guys with Ovi right now. If he moves around, it makes the penalty killers get out of position, forces them to think, opens up passing lanes, opens up shot lanes. And it's been a lot better to watch because we all know as much as we love hockey, when we hate on a power play, it's just the worst two minutes of a game when they're just standing around being so deliberate and everyone in the building knows what's going to happen. And when you're not getting goals, it gets even tougher and tougher. And I felt that the last three years, the power play has been a drag on the team. Right now, it's such a positive. We're talking to Alan May, former NHLer, covering the Washington Capitals for NBC Washington. So everybody talks about... Uh, uh, Toronto being the, the media market of the world and how much coverage everyone gets when they're here with the exception of assistant coaches. We know nothing about the Leaf assistant coaches every year and that included Spencer Carberry who left here to become the Washington Capitals head coach. What can you tell people listening now who are Leaf fans about Spencer Carberry that they had no idea when he was behind the Leaf bench? He loves to talk. And he's, he's a great guy, huge personality, uh, gracious to everyone. And he's done such a great job of, uh, you know, he communicates very well with his players. And, you know, I heard that when he was in South Carolina, heard that when he was in Hershey, that his communication skills were excellent. And he hasn't eaten, eaten his own. He hasn't beat up the team. He doesn't blame losses on players. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't accept the credit for the wins. And he always talks about the group. And you know what, when there's a problem, he's probably in the office about 4 a.m. getting ready, trying to figure it out and try to help them get out of the problems. But he, he just looked at ways to fix problems and find solutions rather than finding and blaming people. But uh, I, I think an incredible personality, a great hockey mind, and just the way he goes about selling what, what he believes in in the game of hockey without acting like he's invented the game because we know how nauseating that can be when general managers and coaches act like they – invented the game created it and, and and you know they're the purveyors of everything excellent in the game he's a humble dude uh he's worked really hard with his coaching staff he lets his coaching staff have a huge stay and i'll give you his number if you want to call him because he's probably willing to talk to you now kim <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, kirk muller there uh he leans a lot on kirk well the whole the entire coaching staff the, these guys they hang they hang out a ton they collaborate uh, the skills coach is a part of it. The video coaches are part of it. Uh, but having Molly around, such a great positive influence all the time, uh, he's been excellent. And he brings, you know, there, there's different points of his life. He's connected to everyone in the game. Uh, it, it's amazing. But he's able to lean on all of that experience, you know, from his playing experience to his different coaching experiences to the people he knows. It's always just a phone call or a text away. So certainly having... Kirk Muller around has been an excellent choice. It's been a great hire. He's fit in very well with the guys. And once again, they're all good to the players. Uh, they don't bend over backwards to the players. They, they get them to change. They help them get better. And it's been great watching these guys all collaborate. All right, looking forward to the game tonight. Have a great call. Alan, great, great catching up with you. Thanks for doing this, pal. Take care. Thanks, okay. Alan. Alan May, NBC Washington. The uh, the Capitals' goal leader since 2005-06 has been Ovechkin. This year, Dylan Strom. Shocked? Dylan Strom has 23 goals, yeah. actually, ahead of Ovi. Smart player. Smart player. High IQ. Uh, not a great skater. No. But no, but he's smart. He's like, to me, he's like They're RNH not a fast light. team. He's like, he's a nuge light. Yeah. The, the Leafs are going to have to really be patient here if, in fact, they get, catch themselves into this 2-1 kind of low-scoring game. You're right. Yeah, that, and that is something that we've preached for the Leafs is that patience. But they do have those sort of guys. 
Don't um, cheat on this team. No. You know what's a fun fact for me, too, is combined blocks and hits among forwards. So you total the blocks and hits, and look at the guys who rank tops of the league. It's uh, Garnet Hathaway, Cal Clutterbuck, and then before Tom Wilson is this Beck Malenstein, this guy on Washington. So they got two guys in the top four that hit and block shots, and that's kind of the way they want to do it, right? They want to slow it down and... I looked up. The, I looked at the box score for your, uh, the game where you got your first critical. Uh, Alan May had a hell of a night that night. Gordy Howe hat trick. <laughs> Did he? Goal, Goal assist. assist in a fight. Yeah, eleven pims plus two. Nick Kiprios plus two. Who did uh, he fight? Uh, let me quickly pull that up. Detroit. Uh, maybe Joey Kosher. Ooh. Good lord. Uh, yeah, yeah, it would have been Joey Kosher. Who'd Steven, win the fight, Alan May and Brad May? Uh, Kevin Hatcher got in a fight that night. A lot of fights. Do you that have night. a roster of Detroit's? I do. Let me let me hear some names. One on of the best roster. things in sports is let's remember a guy. Uh, you would. Do you know who scored two goals for the Stevie Y? Nope. Sean Burr had two goals. Oh, Sean the Burr. late Sean Burr. He had two goals. Uh, but Stevie Eisenman had two two assists. He was a dash one. Uh, Joey Kosher had two assists. He was a plus one. So, yeah, there you go. Did Boria Somling play that game? He did. He did. That was really cool for me. Wow. Really cool. Oh, yeah. That is I amazing, was like, Kippy. I was like six, seven years old when Sittler, Somling, yeah. Lanny were my, like, heroes. That's cool. Man, that's That was cool. like a, a moment. There you go. And you look across the ice and you see the king. Yeah. Very cool. And do you remember who played a net that night for the uh, for you guys? Uh... Uh, Jim R- Rivnak, Bob Mason. Bob Mason. Played in that. Okay. So there you go. I, uh, which great guy too. That's an awesome great guy. That's, I mean, to get uh, to play play against yeah. Salming, that's pretty amazing, Kev. Yeah. Didn't we, try to run him. Uh, not even close. <laughs> <laughs> Autograph book time. <laughs> Can I have your stick? Jersey swap. <laughs> jersey swap. Anything. <laughs> Just don't ask the Raptors about jersey swaps. Yeah, geez. Uh, <laughs> in listening to Alan May talk about Spencer Carberry, so he's an uh, University of Alaska Seawolves alumnus like myself. He was there the year before I was. So when I went on my fly up, usually you call it a fly down, um, you know, he was one of the guys that kind of took me around and showed me the dorms and everything. He is a massive personality and guys like, you know, he partied and guys loved him. I, he's, I'm shocked watching his career ascension because you just kind of see one of your like, you know, Meathead hockey buddies that everyone loves to hang out with, and he, it's really incredible how well he's done for himself and how teams seem to galvanize behind him because, again, he's a wildly popular character. Do you remember that first game the Leafs played against the Caps? I think it was an afternoon game. It was a weird game. It was the first game we ever watched, all three of us together, where Kipper said I was talking too much. Okay, yeah. <laughs> they look like the worst team in the world. Yeah. Like they were truly well, you, you slow. I, I, I watched them at training camp, yeah. and I'm like... Ooh, it may be a tough year. Yeah. It may be a tough year. That yeah. he's wrung this out of them is very impressive. Let me throw this out to you because we often have this coach of the year conversation mm-hmm. with the talkets of the world. And yeah. Like, would he not be in the running if they make the playoffs? I don't see why not. To me, you know, the Jets coaching staff having them in first in a very tough central talk it with the Canucks is, is worth a mention. Knob luck what he's done to the Oilers, but Spencer Carberry is in that conversation. Um, I'll bring prob- it up and I'll bring it up in game time. We'll have the exact Brunette odds. The Predators as well. All right. And we're just getting started. As we said earlier in the show, Paul Maurice will join us. Awesome. I'm really looking oh, forward to that. <laughs> Plus, we'll get a little bit more into Tortorella. Yeah, we ignored him, we but we're going to talk about We didn't even mention no. his pr- post-game Slough remarks off. on benching his captain. We're going to get into that as well. So plenty more on the Real Kipper and Bourne show. Do not go away. That's an order. The Real Kipper and Bourne show, it goes national live on Sportsnet, Sportsnet 650 in Vancouver and Sportsnet 960 in Calgary. This hour, Real Kipper and Bourne brought to you by Bet365, Justin Bourne, Sammy McKee, and yours truly, Nick Kiprios. Let's welcome in the Fifth winningest coach in NHL history, Ooh. Paul Maurice. Mo, 862 wins. I just looked that up. And remind me, you started coaching in the NHL when you were 12. Is that correct? <laughs> it felt like it. Well, when I first started, I felt 12. Yeah, 1995, <laughs> I was 28. 
<laughs> okay, yeah. do, do those numbers blow you away? Do you even have time to think about it or contemplate what that means? Or is your world moving just too fast? No, well, I'll tell you the truth. I never... There was a time where I thought if I could coach 500 games, like that'd be a pretty good career because mm -hmm. not a lot of guys get 500. And after that's a bit of a blur. So the wins were good. I also know I got a real big loss number in there too. <laughs> <laughs> but when I moved into second all time, that one hit me because it's Scotty Bowman, right? Like yeah. that, that was, that was the first one where I, Oh my God, you've been around a long time, yeah. man. Um, and that one, I actually, I'm proud of that. Um, I've had a real good career. I can't call it great yet. You got to win Stanley Cups to call it great, but I've had a very good career and I've been really, really lucky. But that was the number, Kipper, that actually I did take in. Well, you've got a really good shot at it this year, as good as any team in the NHL at, um, at the Stanley Cup. You know, we, we talk about the Florida Panthers on this show quite a bit. Uh, the envy of most teams going into the playoffs, I think because of this seeming competitive nature, this feistiness, our producer likes to say you guys play offended all the time. You know, what, 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 you know, is that something that comes from you? Is it personality driven or do we have the read wrong and that's not the case at all? No, there's give and take there. I, I think it has to do with the personality of the players in the room because you can't, you can't make your team into something that it's not, but you certainly have to foster what you're good at. So there's a little bit of an edge there. We, we've got some mild players, some guys that aren't that aren't, uh, I would say, necessarily competitive in in a in the, It's not necessarily their personality, but they play hard. And mm -hmm. then we've got some guys with an edge, right? That and and it's the Kachuk factor. There are other players like that. Sam Bennett is an underrated competitive man. Um, so we have a bunch of guys that are wired like that. And the rest of them work real hard, and that seems to be their strength. So that's the thing that, as the coach and the coaches, then you want to rally that. I wouldn't say fan it because you get more of a challenge controlling it than necessarily firing it up. But over the course of the year, and we're probably, in truth, sitting in that spot right now. We may have to fire that thing back up with our, the schedule that we've got coming up. We've got to get a little bit more of a snarl on in our games. Not, and I'm not talking about the parade to the penalty box. I'm just talking about the edge on a battle for the puck. So, Mo, remind me, because it seems like ages ago, but it was not. It was uh, around this time last year, end of March. You have your meltdown in Toronto. I think you guys came back in the last minute to win. Yeah. And it's almost as if that moment, your team went from this, we don't know what we are, we, we're not even in the playoffs, to one of the favorites to... to to compete for a Stanley Cup. Did you see that prior to your meltdown that you had what you have now, or did you have to just discover it, or did they have to discover it on their own? That was an absolutely honest reaction to the style of play that night, and and it, it was born out of from the second, from January 2nd, the second period on against the New York Rangers, we had been a pretty good hard team. We had played hard and, and played right. But there was always this kind of tug to go back to this trade chances, flow game and snap it around. But we weren't that team anymore. Like they lost seven guys from that team. So a lot of the skill went out the door the, the summer that I came in. Like we were just different. And But there's still that this desire. So what happened was we got into Ottawa the game prior and we got beat 5-3. Our penalty kill hadn't, you know, that was kind of a weak link for us last year. So we lost on the penalty kill, I felt. But I loved our game in Ottawa. It was hard. Every time we play the Ottawa Senators, it's a physical, nasty confrontation. Both the Kachuk brothers get 17 minutes just before the anthem's over. And, and, and it's fun, right? It's wired. So I loved our game in Ottawa. And then just, you know, you tried to eat it through the first period. But we get into the second period, and I, I don't know, it might have been Carter Verhege. Somebody turned the puck over right at the blue line in front of my bench, and then they scored, and it was offside. So mm -hmm. I got this kind of free timeout and truly just lost my mind. <laughs> like, there was no – I just had it. Yeah. And it was like a year of – I mean, you know, you guys know, and, and, it, and you also don't know the amount of time coaches put into this, like the sheer hours, right? So I just completely freaked out. Um but it was also in truth, like I, after the period was over, I said, look, it's yours now, false. This is yours. I mean, you know the plan. You know what you're good at. You, you know how we're successful. You know how we're not successful. And I'm not begging you for it anymore. And this is yours. And, and Brandon Montour scored in overtime. And that was kind of 
the handoff. The team has to get handed off the players at some point during the year, and it becomes their team. And then from that point on, you know, you're standing behind the bench and you're going to say something to correct something. One of the other players says it, and then that's when it's theirs. And mm-hmm. that's where we get to. I don't think that that, I mean, I don't know. It, there are lots of good screams, fests, and speeches. I think if there was anything good of what I said, it was absolutely honest, and they knew I was telling the truth. I think that was the strength of the, my berserker. But but it did pull something out of them that I think they just didn't know was there, maybe. Maybe, maybe that that it's that that people around them care like you're it's okay to care like it's okay to show some passion in your game it's okay to want to win every night and it's okay that maybe you, you you don't play the friendliest game all the time and if and if you're getting beat you should be a little bit upset about that and i don't i i think if you buy tickets come play the florida planters play there's very few nights walking away going those guys didn't try to earn their money tonight that, yeah. that's what i mean like behind the bench when i'm behind the bench these guys play pretty darn hard it's exciting. It's a hard gap game, so there's some mistakes that come with it. Like you rarely get bored at one of our games, and that's not the coach. That's the players. That's the personality. So most coaches go in and give them a little speech there before they head out to the ice for the game. I don't. I go in. I do mine an hour and a half before the game, and then that room is 100% theirs. And we've been a real good starting team this year, with the exceptional last couple of games. Um, but the players own the room now. It's theirs. Well, that tirade is one of my reasons I think that the NHL should sell like an after dark mic'd up thing or something where we could watch and listen in and get, you know, I'm sure that would go over well. No, <laughs> I, I remember my first three words and there's not one of them you could, you could use. <laughs> in, the, in the hotline area, that, that might have been the end of my career. We, we would have kept <laughs> When I got to number two after that. Fair enough. Um, you know, one thing that we've been talking about uh, on this show is is the, the Toronto Maple Leafs, obviously, relief show in the first hour. And they're, when they played you guys in playoffs last year, they used 22 variations of their forward lines over five games. You guys had four lines. You didn't even use a fifth line in a single game. You stuck to exactly, you know, your group is... You know, how early in a season, like, are we at the time of year where you want to know exactly what those lines are? Where where does that shape come from where you say, this is the mold we're in and we're not going to deviate from that? Yeah, so we didn't as much as it, yeah, that was an unusual series. First of all, I will tell you this. Sheldon Keefe runs one of the hardest benches to match in the league for me mm. because and you, you know, it's that almost 11 and 7 idea. And even if they, they dress 12, it's sometimes it's de facto 11 and 7. When you start moving the under around the lineup, that's a problem. Um, and you know what? They caught me in game, caught me in game three, I think the game that, that they won um, on a line change. And I think it was the difference in the game. So I went back and charted every single line change that had happened in that series. And it's not easy. It's not easy to pattern Sheldon Keefe in his lineup. Now, every team is different. So there are some teams that really flourish with that. And I think the Toronto Maple Leafs do. I think they have, because there's so many center ice options, right? With O'Reilly there, that's just another beast to contend with. And then he could hang two wingers on either side that could make plays or check or skate or hit. It was a real challenge for our team. We were built differently. And we had just really worked in pairs all year. So Luce Duran and Lundell, they're still together here today. Uh, Bennett and Kachuk are still together. The new one for us has been Reinhardt and Barkoff this year. But for the most part, I haven't split them up. And I'll move those other guys around. So we got Tarasenko that comes in. He played four or five games with Barkoff. Now he's going to play with Lund- Lundell. And then probably somewhere in the next five, to, we got this really hard 10-game block coming up in 17 days. So that's where I'm going to do all my experimenting to get a look. But because we didn't make a trade at the deadline last year, and because we have brought, I guess, one forward in, in the top nine, I don't have to do as much experimenting, and I got a pretty good idea of what each line looks like. My job then is to find out when it's not working. So Verhege moves between Barkov and uh, Bennett, and and that's my job is to figure out when it's stale or the matchup the other team has the advantage, and then I'll play with it. I, I will tell you that you know in each uh, before each season, I kind of go around to the team and ask the players what, what they like about the culture of our room and. One of Matthew Kachuk's comments was he loves the fact that everybody doesn't care who they play with. They mm-hmm. can play with any. And and he leads that. He he truly doesn't care who he plays with. Loves playing with Sam Bennett, but you're playing with anybody. And and so there's no um 
nobody's feelings get hurt when I move the line around here or somebody doesn't play much as much as they used to. They're they're all real good about it, real good pros. We're talking to Paul Maurice, head coach of the Florida Panthers. Now, when we competed against each other, North Bay versus Wind- Windsor, did you did you score an overtime goal against us? Like never, ever in my entire career. You, on the other hand, my friend, missed a penalty shot. I did. <laughs> Jablonski, who's in that? Yeah, on a puck that I put my hand on in the crease, and I'm leaning. And you didn't have to go on the bench in those days, so I'm just leaning on the sideboards, kicking my foot, praying to God that Nick Kiprios didn't score, because that might have been game five or six. You guys beat us in game seven, I think, in overtime. Yeah. Oh. Um, I think, I don't know, one of the North Bay Saints in town. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to envision you scoring back in junior and and, yeah. and passing yeah. off that wisdom to Sam or um, uh, to uh, yeah. Reinhardt because there has to be a reason he's now on the cusp of scoring 50 goals. It must be your your coaching and your your, your goal scoring. Really, really smart guys will find a way to take credit for it. Right? We'll <laughs> and, then I had, and then I said this to him. Uh, no, my f- just to, just to backtrack, my first goal in the Ontario Hockey League didn't come to my second year. It was in Ottawa, and it was banked from our end into their <laughs> net in the empty net. I got the puck, and the boys were giving me the absolute business about that being my first goal. So I just threw up the stands, uh, and actually, my mom caught it. So it was a, it was a good ending, and she saw my first goal, but it was from two hundred feet. <laughs> I'd had about the same. So my game was just glassing out, right? No feet, no hands, no skills, uh, glassing out. But anyway, here's this interesting little story about uh, Sam Reinhardt and Barkov. The year before I got here, they tried him for the first 20 games and it didn't work. And then I get to training camp the next year and I'm watching these two guys move around and go, man, that, those guys got to be good together. They have to, right? So I put them back together. And they had chances, and they play such a smart game. They kill penalties together. They're very effective with at that, but they just the puck just wouldn't go in the net for them. So now we're twenty games in, and I got two really important players that aren't producing. So you just uh, that's my job, right? Put players in the position to produce. So we broke them up, and then I would say that if there was a change, Barkoff and Reinhardt came back to camp even faster this year, and and they they trained hard this summer. Not that they don't in the past; they're, they're two of the fittest guys in the team, but it's a half step, perhaps. So in that half step, great players find the way. And or 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 maybe it was just one went early, it built a belief, and then they relaxed and their their greatness comes out. But these two guys, what's special about them for the coach is that as good as they are offensively, they are equally, if not better, defensively, right? So they are they're the they're a scoring line and a checking line on a one. If you they're, they're penalty kill metrics as a pair or elite in this league. So I've got, and they don't cheat the game. So for Sam Reinhardt, and you know what it's like when a guy, the idea gets into their heads that for a player who's, you know, never scored 20, might score 40, but a guy could score 50 goals, you start to see it. And everybody, you know what? Everybody accepts it. You want to cheat the game a little. The shift stays out a little bit longer. You're kind of checking your shoulder to see if the coach is putting you out there when the, when the goal is out. All of that stuff happens. Except Sam hasn't, hasn't, he hasn't had any of that. He, he just plays the game and he plays the right way and his shift length doesn't get longer and he doesn't jam stuff into the middle of the ice he shouldn't and he dumps bucks that he's supposed to. And he cheers his TD. He's just a, a real fine pro. Um, so his contract's up this year. So other than he's mean to animals, um, <laughs> teams away from him this year, he's, you can't, you know what? He's earned it. He's had a great year and he's earned it and he's a fine pro, fine man. Yeah, that's great. The um, you know, the strength of your team seems to be that not cheating, and that's reflected back in goals against. You guys are, I think, second best in the NHL in that category right now. Part of that, Bobrovsky uh, is obviously playing very well, but also like your decor looks like the type of decors we see in the Cup Finals. Oliver Ekman Larson has showed up and you know sort of rejuvenated his career. Has he been maybe the most pleasant surprise on the decor in getting you guys to where you've been at defensively? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Mm-hmm. There are some stories that go with it with that though. The first is it shouldn't be right because Oliver Ekman Larson that we remember a few years ago as a dynamic player, what, what I, you know, in talking to him, he just felt that he had been hurt for two years and he spent two summers rehabbing, not training. So when he stepped out of the lineup, and I think that would have been in February, by the time the summer hit, this summer hit, and he had been bought out, he was actually healthy. So the summer was spent training instead of rehabbing. 
and he comes back in and, and, and also, right. There's a, it's not about pressure. It's about expectation. He could come in and just play the game. He doesn't have to lead the room. He doesn't have to answer for the power play. He just has to play the game. Yeah. So when we found this guy, he'd come in and he's in a great mood and he's a good veteran pro and he makes money, but, but he's got an edge to him too, that I never saw when he was in Arizona, probably a function he's playing 20, 30 minutes a night here. His minutes are down, but he's played with an edge. So he would be the biggest, the biggest surprise that you shouldn't have been surprised about if you went to a look at it. Uh, Nico Mikola would be the guy probably around the league that people didn't know that has shaped the way our blue line looks as much as anybody. Mm. So we lose Stahl and Gudish, really important for the fabric and the character. Mm. Mikola has taken up the play of those two men, uh, respectfully. He's just been fantastic for us. And so our blue line's gotten stronger. Sergei Bobrovsky and Anthony Stollers. Then now there's a story there too, because this guy, his numbers are phenomenal, and his game is too. And and both of those guys have been incredibly consistent. I would say though the one metric, the thing that's changed our team the most has been our penalty kill. So we we were not a good penalty killing team last year. Kevin Stenland coming out and Nico Mikola coming in are the two big pieces to that. Uh, Dmitry Kulikov kills penalties for us, so that's another defenseman that wasn't with us, but we added people to kill penalties. Uh, so Van Lefebvre runs that on the uh, on that for our team as a coach. He's a penalty killer in his career. So we feel we've got a good mix there. But the, the biggest improvement would be our blue line got shaped in a way for us to survive both Ekblad and Montour being out for the first 16, 17 games of the season. And then when they came back, we found out we had a pretty good core. Mo, well, I'm not sure if you're up on this storyline, but there's a certain NHL coach out there that recently healthy scratched his captain. And the perception out there, Mo, is that you treat all your players the same, right? Doesn't matter. So can you confirm for me today that if you healthy scratched Barkov, it would have no different effect if you say you picked Ryan Lomberg. <laughs> <laughs> Kip set a trap here. See how you do with this one. <laughs> yeah. Must be a Philadelphia thing. I, I healthy scratch Roddy Brendamore when he was the captain of our team. He's still not very happy about that. Oh, is he still hanging on to that? Where, where, which game? Uh, no, it was a regular season game, and it was in Pittsburgh, and we won two one. And it would be, yeah, a while ago. So, and I still remember it. It's a hard thing to do. Um, you know what though. We all have, the, okay, so when you walk into a room as a coach, I think you establish a certain trust, but before trust, a certain amount of truth, right? Like, like these are the things that we're going to be, we're just going to tell the truth on. We're going to do this as a hockey team. We're going to handle these four or five things. And that has to be true of Barkoff and Lomberg. Whatever it is that you hold to be true, we're going to be this kind of team. We're going to we're going to make sure. You no, know, we're going to make some mistakes. We got some skill. We got a little bit of this, but these are the four core principles of our hockey club. That has to be true for Barkov and Lombard. How far down the line you get before you scratch a guy? That's technique and that style, I guess, of the personality of the coach. So if you've done it to two or three other guys, and they're all looking at you, going, "Hey, you just bench those three guys," and now it's his turn because he just he just broke the code, whatever that is. Um, kind of in a spot where if you don't do it, then you got a real problem. But it doesn't happen very often because if you, you know, even great guys make mistakes, I understand that, but you pick your leaders right, you don't get into that situation very, very often. I think this is towards, I was eavesdropping on you guys talking about the coach of the year. Thanks for the vote, Falls. But um, <laughs> I think I think John Tortorella is a strong, strong candidate because he has a way of doing things and he doesn't deter that. So the players trust them. The men always like it, but they got a pretty good idea what it's going to be like when they come to the rink every day. This is the guy we're going to get. This is what he values. This is what he's going to hold true. And at that, I think John's elite, and he's been always like that. So it fits very well, maybe, for the Philadelphia Flyers and John Tortorella, where, where maybe it wouldn't fit for me to do that because I haven't done it to other players. There's not a lot of healthy scratches that have come out. I don't know, maybe I miss a meeting. But if that's your rule, then that rule has to be true of everybody. We don't, we don't really have that rule here, but I've also never really had anybody late for a meeting. We got a rule that everybody's got my cell number. If you're going to be late, you call. If you call me two minutes before you're late for a meeting, you're late. You call me 25 minutes before you meet because your sick kid's sick, you're stuck, at, well, you get here when you can get here. Life happens. So you, every team has its own set of rules. And the coach has a certain bandwidth of truth that he has to stay in uh, for every player. 
but it's also not true. Uh, anything outside that, you know what? If if bark officers, the pizza right up the middle and they score a goal, yeah, I'm not scratching. <laughs> there are. Those, those I did, just I just find it real interesting that you you started your 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 answer with he's still not happy with me. So w w what happened in in the weeks that followed the next game? Uh, d w were you able to move on, or is it something that kind of hung over everyone's head? I don't remember. I mean, this is a while ago, Kipper. So all yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't think that Roddy and I were warm and fuzzy with each other anyway. Straight through. Yeah. Um, okay. We Eastern Conference together, but I don't. Yeah. I don't. You don't like. You know. You, you, I. I mean, I. I've got his young man, and he's got an incredible young son. Great human being in our organization. Plays for our American League team. I love the guy. But but the the pressures and the competition of pro sports sometimes two guys that might be great fishing buddies just aren't going to get along because of the way your pressure points right everybody has a way and and some guys are perfect for some coaches and some aren't Roddy and I just he had gotten to a point at that year I think he was minus nineteen early in the year we were floundering so I scratched him but I'm going to blame it on Jim Rutherford that's what he you know I'll blame Jim he's in the Hall of Fame he can't hurt it. that's yeah. right. Mo, great stuff, man. We really appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, you, you have our vote, but we're just trying to make this thing interesting oh, for coaches. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you guys were right on it. I mean, Rick Tockett has done an incredible job. Rick Bonus with the injuries that he'd had, incredible job. There's two or three teams that I think you got to wait to see a few of them make the playoffs. I think Philly, that, that from, you just got to go back. You go, like, go back to March of last year to where the teams were and mm -hmm. what they were like and how long the rebuild is, and then you turn them on. I'm also saying that because Philly's beat, beat us twice, and they played us hard, right? Like, those were they, – they, they were a heavy man game in there about a week ago, and they scored with 20 seconds left to go in the game to win it. Um, they played a hard, hard man's game and uh, got a lot of respect for the way they play. We're going to let you go, man. Thanks for doing this, Mo. All the best to close out the season, and we'll stay in touch, okay? Paul Maurice, everybody, head Appreciate coach your of the time. Florida Panthers. Oh, that was awesome. I think, uh, honestly, this sounds like hockey geek, but I think that's my favorite interview we've ever done. Okay. He's so, just, like, he... I, I like, wrote down 40 it's, things It's, to it's talk. amazing, uh, just, we know how he wants to coach, right? Brutal honesty, and mm -hmm. just tell him the way it is, the way he sees it, and then he comes on an interview, does the same thing. I'm, I'm kind of really surprised... And we'll get into this after the break or we're going to do game time. I don't know whatever our producer wants to do. <laughs> but I want to get into this after um, on on how honest and candid he was on benching Brendamore. That's that was, that was big news for me. Yeah, you think that ties into the Couturier? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yep. I do. Um, I was just, as I like to do when you mentioned junior hockey, I brought up the team that he played for. Yeah. The Windsor Compuware Spitfires doesn't get much more mid eighties than that. <laughs> uh, Keith Gretzky on that team, yes, and Big uh, score. Adam, Adam Graves as well. Yeah. He's on his junior team, so there you go. So you play and they against had some them. tough guys too. Okay, I think uh, I fought Mo maybe. Really? Yeah, yeah, I think I did. The leading pal Pim, oh, he shoved or something. I don't know. Uh, the Pim getter on that team was Kevin Kerr. Kevin Kerr, two hundred and sixty six Pims, Buffalo in Sabre, games. Yeah. ex North Bay Centennial. Brian Blad had some Pims, so. Lots of lots of fights back then, but yep. I thought that was pretty interesting, Kippy. So do you want to do game time here? Or do you want to go to break and then we'll come back and do everything? Let's do game time. Let's Okay. Get it out of the way. Get it out of the way. All right. Uh let me pull up my thing here. And as I pull up my sheets. It's game time presented by Bet365. Visit the app for the latest odds. Find out why it's never ordinary at Bet365. Must be 19 plus. Ontario only. Please play responsibly. Now, um, I was trying to go on here to find the coach of the year. Uh, numbers on Bet365, but at the very moment, they're not posted, which is interesting. I'm not sure they're making some additions. They just heard that interview with <laughs> Paul Maurice, <laughs> bump him up. and they're like, wow, he's minus yes. 500 now, so we got to get him up at the top. We forgot about him. But it's funny. I was looking through a lot of these futures, and there's no real races. I mean, heart, uh, the heart, you know, Nathan McKinnon is a minus 200 favorite now. Austin Matthews, who was the favorite, uh, sunk like a stone plus 1800 now so wow. he's way out of it yeah. what is that like in 10 days two yeah i think he's long. three goals in his last 11 games or something i mean the rocket richard he's still a massive favorite he's like yeah. minus 5000 to like you yeah. just you're not gonna make any money on that the norris trophy they seem to think that quinn hughes is a ma he's minus 450 so it's like there's no the vesna connor hellebuck minus 800 to, to bet 365 these are all set these in stone so 
uh, not a ton of races in the standings or even in the in the stats here. So um, just looking at the games tonight. Leafs in Washington, a pretty big favorite, minus 135. Uh, I really don't have a lean on this. I, I, there, I think there's, there's two different narratives coming together here, the second half of the back-to-back. And if I'm not mistaken, didn't Washington just come off their West Coast road trip? Isn't this their first game back? Because they played Calgary, right? Uh... Yeah, they beat Calgary 5-2 on the weekend. So I think this is their first game back from a West Coast road trip. So, you know, that's a classic narrative where they teams always lay, lay an egg in that game. So... I'm not sure which way to lean on this, but if I'm going to do one thing, uh, you know how I love the the happiness hedge? Yeah. Uh, I was going to look up um, uh, Ovechkin's goals against the Leafs, like his numbers, but I, so I was like, it's a lot. He scored a lot of goals against the Leafs throughout his career, yep. owned them, in fact. So tonight, give me an Alex Ovechkin goal at plus 140 just as a little bit of a happiness hedge because I don't want that to happen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, go back to... Uh... The MVP thing for a second. No problem. Okay. Where are you guys uh, on Kucherov and McKinnon right now? Because it seemed like it was McKinnon's McKinnon and just watching Kucherov now, Tampa getting hot. He's had 11 points, I think, in his last three games. Like, he's on fire. He's taken over the league lead. He's got yes. 118 points, one more than McKinnon. The only thing that bothers he, me about Kucherov is... Everything. He's minus... <laughs> Two, I think. Yeah. He, Couldn't he, have said it better he, myself. Yeah. He uh, will not. I mean. He's so good. He's so good. He's unbelievably special. But Nathan McKinnon is unbelievable. Connor McDavid chasing down the two of them from, from a distance. I, I, but I think it's a real race. Yeah? Yeah, I do. You could do worse than betting on not McKinnon in terms of trying to find odds. But so they have uh, the field versus Nathan McKinnon, and that is plus 160. So you're betting... It's not great. You're, You're getting McDavid and Kucherov combined. It, yeah. To me, it's just I, I look at how good how good um, Colorado has been and how much better they're going to be. Like they're just they're forecasting. I just, I just think McKinnon is the clear heart winner. Today. What about Hellebuck? Does he have any sort of? He is not on. He is a seventy-five to one shot. Ah oh, man, throw ten at it. It's he. He's. Like his goal saved above expected numbers or as good as any, like the Carey Price heart season, like he's yeah. getting into that category. They have a trophy for the goalies. I know. No one wants to vote for it, but the reality yeah. might be he's the most important guy. I mean, it's like a pitcher winning MVP. Yeah. To me, it's just you like play every fifth day. Yeah. It doesn't like Verlander, I think, is the last one to do it. It's they have their own ones, you know, Cy Young. Yeah. Anyways, can't market a goalie. Can't. No. Really tough to sell, but that's not what we're doing here. We're voting on the best guy. <laughs> Uh, minus, <clears throat> minus 450 for Quinn Hughes to win the... That's quite a, And who's second, McCarr? Plus 350. I believe early in our sh show that we were made fun of for having Mike Kelly on and him saying that he's going to win the Norris, and he got absolutely buried for that. And looks like he might have been right uh, that day. It was a good call. All right. Uh, that was game time. Presented by Bet365. Visit the app for latest odds. Find out why it's never ordinary at Bet365. Must be 19 plus. Ontario only. Please play responsibly. Okay, let's take a quick break, and we'll come back with some uh, NHL uh, news and notes. Coyotes news uh, floating around. Uh, Nash, the GM of Team Canada. Rick Nash. Rick yeah. Nash. Yeah. For the G World Championship. You thought I was talking about the basketball guy? I thought maybe the uh, hockey team, <laughs> Nash. Nash. And Phil. still some meat on the bone when it comes to this Tortorella uh, situation. I'll tell you what really ticked me off after the game. All right. What yeah, a Peter Griffin really yeah. grinds my gears. What what As if he didn't piss me off. He, he doubled got, down, he, didn't he? He doubled down on his post-game comments, and we'll get into that after you the break. You know what really grinds my gears? There, there you is. go. There you go. That and more when we return to Real Kipper and Bourne. We're back at Kiprios. Justin Bourne, Sammy McKee. So watching... The Leafs crawl back in the third period against John Tortorella's captainless team last uh, night. How many, like, were, were you just sitting there going, for no other reason, oh. if the Leafs come back and win, it'll look good on a Tortorella team that couldn't hold on to a lead and maybe a Selkie winner could have helped. I mean, they ended up scoring a goal on a meltdown play by the Leafs, but listen, they turtled and still got filled in and gave up three goals in the third period, even though they didn't lose the game. 
it still happened without Couturier that they got filled in for 20 minutes. Lilligren banged one off the end boards from between the hash marks with a chance to tie the game. Yeah. Like they had multiple chances in that last minute to tie it. Yeah. And the narrative on old Torts and Torts. matrixed a few bullets there. Hey, before we move on, we were just talking to Paul Maurice and we were, so I was looking at his hockey DB page in the break. So he was, his last year with the comp where Spitfires was 88. Yeah. And he was an assistant coach. The next season. The next season. In the NHL. No, no. Yes. In the, for that same team. Oh, really? He yes. immediately became yeah. an Correct. assistant coach. That's crazy. So how old would he have been? Leadership. 22, 21. Not even. Not even. He no, be... he would have been an overage. Yeah, so, so he like would have 21. been 21. That's crazy. I would have loved right. to know and probably what his salary I... was as a 21-year-old assistant oh, coach in the OHL in 1988. Pro probably 20 bucks no <laughs> different than the players. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he was beloved. Yeah. And... Of course, Jimmy Rutherford was the general manager of the uh, Windsor Spitfires back oh, then. Oh, really? They started this relationship. He saw something in Paul that uh, give Jimmy full credit. Turns out he was right. Yeah, he was right. This guy had a, a, a brilliant hockey mind. I forgot he was the Marlies coach for a year, too, in the AHL. He yeah. coached him for 80 games. Anyways, so you were getting pretty hot and bothered there. But no. Um, of course, I want to hear what he said today. Yeah. The one thing that stood out yesterday for me was that Tortorella did not, he made the decision to healthy scratch Couturier before the skate. So he purposefully made himself unavailable mm. to answer any questions about that. Yeah. He ducked it. He ducked it. 100%. And then post game. We have he, the clip if you want he, it. Okay, let's play it and then yeah. we'll come out. Yeah. As I told you, I'm, I'm putting the players out on the ice to win a particular game, and these were the 20 that we decided to go with. He, he seemed a little, you know... Like, I'm not talking on Sean. I'm not debating with you. I'm not conversing with you. It's between Sean and I. So just talk to me about the game, guys. When Sean was out, how do you think the team responded, especially... It has nothing to do with Sean being out. Are you asking me about the team? How did they respond in your eyes? Our team played good tonight. The audacity, getting your back up over people asking questions about you scratching your captain. Like, what did you think was going to happen? Which is the biggest storyline. Of course it is. Brooksy, if I want to explain it to you, I would. <laughs> it's actually disrespectful to Couturier that he thinks it's a non-story. It's an entertainment product. Well, what do you think we're doing here? It's not like all of them coming in there and asking him about scratching yeah. Bobby Brink. Right. It's the captain of the Flyers who just You was might named... have to have a thought on that post-game. And I'm okay. I am absolutely okay with him saying that I played the guys that I thought I could win that night. Sure. No problem at all. But why can't you mix it in with something that kind of alleviates a little bit of the pressure off the organization? To mention, listen, Sean's a great guy. He's a big part of our future. And we're going to just something. Mm -hmm. Give them something. But that pours gasoline on the fire and you know the media they're gonna you ducked it this morning you ducked it last night we're coming right back at you the next day and not only that we're gonna go into that dressing room we're gonna ask 20 of your your players yeah you don't want to answer that story you are now driving me into asking the players now they've got to deal with it for sure Brian Burke has talked about going out and like making himself a story to take the heat off the players intentionally in some cases. This is deflecting it back to the players. Oh, and by the way, your captain has said to the media that he's not real happy with his treatment lately. You don't think that's relevant for the news media to wonder about your club? And the worst part is that he acts like, how, how dare you even ask me? You know, like you peons. You know? It's... And listen, we just heard from Paul Maurice talking about Brenda Moore mm -hmm. and making him a healthy scratch. Yeah. And his first words were like, yeah, he's still probably not happy with me. And that is 100% true. Mm -hmm. Like they don't, you don't get to recover off of this. It'll always be there moving forward here. I don't know. I don't know how this kind of 
fixes itself. I really don't. Well, Couturier would have to be the bigger man and say, you know, all right, well, I guess I'll just take my lumps and I'm here till 2030. And But do you want to take your lumps? Is this the way you want to go moving forward, that I'm supposed to be your, your captain and your representation leading this team and clearly you have a problem with me? Yeah. Like, again, for me, this is strictly about a guy that was recently named your captain. If Couturier had an A on his jersey, I've got no problem with healthy scratching him. Mm -hmm. But not four weeks ago where you and your team of what? Your general manager, maybe your president, Jonesy, uh, Briere, you were supposed to have collectively got together and said, this is our face. Yeah. And you were a part of that, or we at least think you were a part of that. Right. Why would you dump all over him like that? And then in the post-game comments, you can't find one good thing to say about Sean Couturier. One good thing. He's a good guy. He's a leader. We just got to get him on board. But in the meantime, I played the best players, and that's it. Bang we're, on. We're good. We're good. Sean's a good kid. I like him. He's our leader. I, he has my backing to be the captain of the team. Did he say any of that? No. And if you expect to to turn this franchise around and win playoff games in the years ahead, he's going to be the core of what you're doing. You want him to get going and playing well. And it seems like this just added to the pressure. Like, he's talking about, oh, he hasn't played well over the past, you know, or other people have mentioned that he hasn't played well over the past month. That's right when he was named captain. Maybe he's feeling pressure, and maybe he doesn't need the pressure doubled on him. Maybe Tortorelli point. didn't want him as captain. How about that? Well, that's the impression you get, isn't it? How can you not have that impression? How can you not be led to that conclusion that maybe Tortorella doesn't really think that you're a captain here? So for me, making him a healthy scratch just isn't a reflection on his play. It's a reflection on maybe you and people around you made the wrong decision making this guy captain. It's funny because he could have... By speaking about this and explaining it, you could make sense of it and saying, look, he's having a tough go. We feel like he needed a rest, but, you know, we, he's obviously such a big part of our club. You know, we're going to see if we can get one for him tonight and let him watch from up above. He'll yeah. be ready to go the next night and back in and off we go. Do they need a captain, by the way, at this stage of their development? Next, next question, will they do a win and you're in type of thing and leave him out of the lineup for another game after beating the, the Leafs? Uh, I we, cannot see Keith Jones and Daniel Breer going wow. We're healthy scratching our captain another game. Yeah. Uh, good on that. We have more healthy scratch news. Okay. TJ Brody will be a healthy scratch tonight. As, oh, good call. As Connor Timmons comes in. Yeah. Ryan Reeves is an eye injury, and Noah Gregor will also play in his place. Hmm. So Labushkin's still sick. Yeah. Timmons coming in. Still. Yeah. I, 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 I said it two weeks ago Yeah. Uh, that he was not trending for me, Brody. So I, I'm, I'm surprised, but... Good on them. Yeah. Right? Good it, on them. It's the right decision. He's really been struggling in this. And I'm curious to see if Keith comes out and says, hey, we need this guy going. Yeah. This is about, you know, helping him, not, you know, yeah. the team necessarily. Yeah. So what did you um what, what did you think of the the fight between uh Ryan Reeves and uh, uh Nick uh, Deloria? Had nothing to do with the hockey game. Crappy it was not one. momentum. It, yeah. They arranged this guy, nothing. It was pointless. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. It it didn't, it, it just didn't fit. It just didn't fit. It was, it was a fight from 10 years ago where two guys planned to fight off the face off. You go, if you guys are done, we're still playing a hockey game over here. We're good. We can play again. Okay. Yeah. But so it's very similar to what happened with Rempe too. And we all like that one. No, the Rempe Which one, one is like. Which Rempe fight? The, the Reeves Rempe. Yeah, it was a, it was a new, a new guy in town establishing okay. himself in the no, league, listen, trying to like take you, on all you, the heavies. You, you, you knocked Labushkin out of the game. Yeah, like, yeah taking yeah, runs. And... To, to me, to me, I, I didn't like the timing of it either. You know, from Ryan Reeves' perspective, because I, too late. It's too late, mm -hmm. and we've had this conversation yeah. before that I'm 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 supposed to be the X factor. I'm supposed to stop you from running our players. Mm -hmm. So you get to you get to pick and choose, but. You know, what bothered me last night on the on the telecast last night was then just, you know, cutting deals, you know.
Well, the, the, in the background of uh, one of the, the reporters on stuff. TSN. Yeah. Or yeah. they're just like, okay, yeah. well, yeah, whenever you want to do it. And like, and then you got the sense that Reeves like, let's just get out of the way right away. Let's just do this thing we're going to do, which to me makes it so clearly separate from sticking yeah, up for people. And it, and or, it was a bad fight. And when Brody, it just, sorry, he got poked in got the eye. Got in the eye or something. Yeah, yeah. it's just, it was a bad fight. It needs to be more around the game and the emotional element yeah, of he, the game. Reeves had been playing a more impactful brand of hockey for the Leafs. I don't yeah. hate the idea that he wants to fight yeah. um, for the Leafs, but that one didn't make so, sense. So, yeah, just if you're just joining us, uh, healthy scratch TJ Brody tonight, which is All a big right. deal for the Leafs. All right. Uh, you guys surprised Rick Nash, named general manager of Canada's men's team for the uh, world championship? That one kind of caught me off guard a little bit. Does it feel like maybe some experience for him before becoming GM of the Columbus Blue Jackets? I've said this all along that that that's not the job you want, Rick. CBJ. Yes. Why not? Because you want the president of hockey ops. You yeah. want the one above it. You feel it. like you that want a requires name. some experience to a, just be a president? No, no, no. Well, if you have, if you have the right person guiding you, if you if you if you have good experience around you, I think at this stage you can do it. Let's have a frank and honest talk about the role of NHL GM and how it has been usurped by President, by Gorton, by Rutherford, yeah. by Dubis. You know, this president title is now the person calling the shots. To me, they used to be a more business-focused role, right? They worried about selling tickets and, you know, uh, PR and marketing and all. Now it's like, is the GM making the decisions about personnel or is the president? President. Well, he has final say. He's got to stamp. He's got to stamp all the decisions. It's uh, collaborative. Which kind of loops us around on Brandon Shanahan then. Does it not? Like, who, sure. you know, if he's been here for eight years or whatever, is he well, did we not the learn, guy making decisions? Did, did we not learn a lot, though, about... What? I just... It's uh, always about the Western Leafs. Canada is just like, you guys are having to talk about Rick Nash. No, hey, hey. <laughs> It's talking about Listen, Brandon uh, Al, Alvin <laughs> came in that first year and we're like, Jimmy Rutherford's the man. Yes. Well, the, right? the same with Ken, Ken Hughes in Montreal. Yes. It's like, yeah, but I mean, Gorton's going to make the decisions. You know, well, until he's established or whatever. And now is it Jeff Jackson in, uh, yes. in Edmonton? Is he going to yes. be president and GM? What's his? I would moment? imagine that they'd have a new general manager. Yeah. Uh, everything points to the direction that uh, this will be Ken Holland's last year. I don't know if a Stanley Cup changes that, if he even wants it, if he wants to continue. We do know that his contract's uh, up, if I'm not mistaken. And. Is it his son that would be kind of next in line? Is that? Oh, he's not a king. I recognize, yeah. but it's, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I don't for know. The throne. Throne. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe he'd be in the running. Yeah. Well, Brad, is that right? Yeah. Rick Nash played a lot for Team Canada. Was a great player for yeah. Team Canada. Represented. You watched him. a lot of Team Canada. You should be the GM. See, he he, played, he, he was he was two time gold medalist. Scored my favorite goal in hockey history uh, he, against Russia. No. He can come in you, there. You've never watched a Team Canada game in your life. Team. <laughs> yeah. Who? He could go into Columbus and help them, though, for sure. Just be, just his history alone, yeah. and he's a good guy, and he's he wants to learn, and he's a hard worker. He's fresh. He's. They could do a lot worse than Rick yeah. Nash in a in a in a in a big position. But like I said, make sure who's around him, who's got the experience, who can. Guide him. Yes. I uh, do. Oh, he, I, I feel like you need some experience. You can't just throw a guy in that role. Uh, Jets, boys. Jets beat the Rangers. How about Shifley Hatcher? Shifley's breakaway goal where it's like he's he gives it the look behind. He knows how much time he has. And then he just shoots it right in the net. Yeah. I thought it was a fantastic a goal. A little bit of deception. Like he's going to do something that's a little more slow yes. or whatever. He just fires yeah. it. Love that. Really good. Jets uh, go in the cup, boys. Jets. I the, told you that the other day. Our off-air that today. show is more and more uh, believing in the, in the Winnipeg Jets, which is encouraging. And Toffoli is sneaky good pickup. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. He he really changes the look of that group. And I said this on the air the other day, just the way they can move guys up and down in the lineup, like Nemesnikov, 
Love Ehlers. Every line he's on is suddenly super effective. They are at 93 points, first in the Central. You know, that would mean right now, oh, you don't want to face Vegas, but... Uh, oh, what, are you sure? Canucks, they probably played Nashville. You sure but, you don't want to face Vegas? Hey, what's going on there? They can't get Tampa a save. thumped up. They can't get a save. Their goaltending's been killing them. They're not going to miss the playoffs, are they? Well, the Wild are now ahead of the Blues. I think they're three games, three points back of them now. Three points Just back of Vegas. Quickly, Come on, Wild. Do, do it. Doing non-game time on, uh, I was just looking at the odds on Bet365 for the Jets to win the Cup. They're 12 to 1. They're behind Vegas, Dallas, Boston, Vancouver, Florida, Rangers, mm -hmm. Carolina, Colorado, Edmonton. They're behind all those teams. To me, 12 to 1 is decent value for the Jets. Buddy, Connor Hellebuck. Yeah, man. He's having, he's having a prime season. Maybe the best he'll ever have. Vegas could miss the playoffs here, boys. They're, they're not... God, it's just be, be so sweet, wouldn't it? Do you think, like, everybody wants to see them miss? Everybody. I don't. I don't. Everybody. I don't. I don't either. Why not? Because they're, like, having them know. in there now. Like, they've, they've established and themselves. And, they, the radio and, show. and they've got... Fans don't. And they've got, like, big brass ones. Yeah. That's why. I agree. That's why I like them. Because they go out there and they say, I'm not playing it safe. Right. They're saying, we will blow through the laws and the rules of the What sport. rules did they break? We, JB, uh, we're doing the thing where we pretend they've done nothing wrong. Yes, we are. Give me factual evidence. Yeah, we got like a PI working <laughs> on Mark Stone who's <laughs> chopping wood in his backyard or something. One hundred percent healthy. Go, you, hey, I've got hey, it. Go hide in the bushes and yeah. get something on Mark Stone. But he found the Minnesota Wild. That's what I'm doing right now. PI is all over there. They've been just swinging since day one. What's Since that? day one, their franchise. Yeah. They've and, you know swung for the say, fences. They've traded first round picks. They've brought think of the guys they're running. Stone, Eichel, Petrangelo, yes. Hannafin. Yes. Like they just bring in superstars. And I I will say I am half arguing just to argue because I love that. I love you know, I recognize elite talent wins you games. I hate that Seattle Kraken were like, maybe we can like middling players in analytics and defense. How about this thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I I hate that. Now it's like To be fair to Ron Francis, every everybody like they wised up. George McPhee just absolutely rinsed, rinsed everybody. Oh, yeah. And now they're rinsed like oh, you're Smith. not pulling Brian a George Riley Smith and March or so. You're okay. not pulling a George McPhee on me. Yeah. No, you go way harder for Seattle, for they, sure. They Anaheim gave up a first and Theodore to protect someone else. I know. In that? Yes. Oh, my God. Go, go look <laughs> back at the, some of the names that Anaheim could have kept on their blue line. I know. Like Theodore, like uh, Lindholm. Anaheim's blue line, like three years ago, was Josh Manson, Theodore, yes. Cam Fowler, they were Hampus Lindholm. Lindholm. They were stacked. How, how did they end up with nothing out of that? Mickey Mouse might, might have had something to do with it. Isn't there Disneyland? I think so. Yeah. I think it was Mickey Mouse who, that did it. Well, who named what Ducks defenseman? Cam Fowler. Oh, uh, Jamie Drysdale. Wait. No, he Can got George. Uh, yeah, like, <laughs> they were stacked. Anyways. Yeah. Uh, do we care about uh, Coyotes? Gary <laughs> Bettman <laughs> saying a uh, they're in a holding pattern for oh my God. year number now 24. Now Arena, folks. You heard it here first. <laughs> Is it too late now? Was first. No one is talking Salt Lake City now next year. Well, Bill Daly said that they're going to let Arizona participate in this auction. And if they don't get the land, it seems like it's too late to pivot at that point to go to Salt Lake City. The Jets went from Atlanta to Winnipeg it, in May. Is it like an auction like the one I see like on the show uh, Hoarders? <laughs> I don't know. Imagine losing this auction, though. The no, whole hockey hoarders. world's watching. What is it? What is it? It was... Uh, Storage Wars. Storage, Storage Wars. Wars. Which is an electric know. show. I love that show. I imagine there's a lot of that Who happening wants a mullet in Arizona. Yeah. No one. Who's got $1,000 for a mullet arena? Move them. All right. Our thanks to the head coach, Paul Maurice, who was absolutely fantastic. If you're just joining us, download that. It was uh, something. And who did we talk about in the first hour? Alan, Alan May. May. All right. Just three games on tap. Enjoy it. And we're back tomorrow on Real Kipper and Bourne.